All right, so this, again, this is your review, okay? Um, like a question like number three, that would be calculator-based. If you want to start thinking, like, where am I going to have my calculator or something like that, where you have to figure out which regression it is. There's two that are like that. One, that it tells you what kind it is, and then find the model, and then answer questions. And one where you have to classify it as linear, exponential, or quadratic. So you'll want to make sure that you know, I would say, go to make sure you write down your R squareds. Like I would open up, I would go to the calculator, I would graph that, I, you know, enter in the data, then I would hit model and I would write down all of your R squares, compare them obviously, because you're not seeing the full picture. It's going to be hard to see it just from the picture. Sometimes linear looks like quadratic, looks like exponential, depending on the values that you're given. And then best R squared or closest to one, that's what you want to do. And then you'll answer questions based on it. So you want to know how to enter the information. You want to know how to graph it. You want to know how to find the model. You want to know how to find a value of a specific thing, like what's going to happen at Y of whatever. And then also, when does this happen? And that's where you're going to graph that horizontal line and see where they match. So that would be like something like D on three. So all of those parts you want to make sure you're prepared for. Any questions on this first page? So one and two are where you set up your systems of equation. You solve for A, you solve for K. And then you plug back in at the end and just give me the equation. Um, yeah. For D, isn't it where you, you plot the line as like Y equals? Yep. And you find where they intersect? Yep. Because I got 14. Like Did you round up? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're rounding... You have to see where does it happen. And if it's happening 13.7, that's happening in your 13th year. Does that make sense? If it just says to round or it doesn't say it, I would keep 13.747. Okay. Yeah. Dane. Okay. So now next slide. All of this uh, is non-calculator. Okay. You got into what identifying percent increase and decrease setting up a model, and then talking about what happens when we start to use two different time frames, like 13 and 14. Yeah. Um, do we, for, for, some, for some of the um, like practices, uh, for identifying the percent increase, you can use just a percent increase or just a decrease. Do we also have to write the value on what you said? Yes. You're going to give me which one it is and the actual percent. Hadley, you had a question there? Um, how did you get those the... How did what? How did you get 2.9 for 6? For which one? Uh, for 6. So it said it had a point. It had a 5.4% decrease. So I have to move this. So it's 0 0.054. And then you're subtracting it from 1. Yeah. And then, um, oh, like give it as one value, you mean? Yeah. I yeah. Like one minus. Yeah, no, you'll want to simplify it. Take it to that next step. Okay, and then um, are the, the doubles? Yeah. Um, it says T equals something else, so I just change the top variable. Does that matter? Like you don't have T as your variable? Yeah. Um, just try to be specific because it's going to give you a variable in that situation. Make sure you use the one that's given. Is that what you mean? Right, but your x is t. That's all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It just gave you a variable for that. So h is just the number of time of when it doubles or when it halves. That's all. That's what that represents. In your equation. Yeah. It's the other way around, though, right? Yeah. You want it to be specific to what it is. So, you, yeah, this is the value that's happening each minute. And then the reverse of that, so like this one says it indicates it by every second, and then it does S divided by 60. Think about what would happen if that was reversed too, right? Because we had those 
questions in this section too. If it gave it to you, so if it gave it to you by minute, let's say, um, and then it asked for it by second, now you would take that minute value and you would be dividing it by the number of seconds. So think about you could go in either direction. Like we said, if it said a certain amount per week and then you wanted to know per day, you have to take the week and divide it by the days. So it would be divided by seven. If it said something per day and then it wanted you to do something for a week, now you're multiplying by seven. So both of these, you had to actually divide it like it was S over 60 or D over 365. But think about what would happen if it was in reverse. If it was in reverse, you'd be multiplying instead of dividing. Yeah. Because since it specifies it in your question, then it's asking us that already. I mean, it's asking what the change is. So the change would be 1.09 to the 60th each minute. You would need that. I thought you would just ask what is the change to each minute. Yeah, but specifically for this, you want to get as specific as you can for the model you're given. Lucas. No, because you start with one, so it's one plus. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So if it's at 6.5, that's an increase of 550. You always have to add one to it, or 100% if you're doing it in percent. A verbiage, so it says here, like if F of S blah, blah, indicates a quantity increasing by a factor of 1.09 every second, and then it says, what does this indicate? So if it was per second, if it was just S, then it would be per second, that would be my unit. But if I take S and I divide it by 60, what's happening there, right, is you're taking this as your actual thing that's happening every second, and you're dividing, so by dividing that by 60, we're taking it and we're actually doing, we're actually doing by 60, which is there's 60 seconds in a minute. Oh, okay. So you're not dividing the rate there, which is what's different. You're dividing your time, which is going to have an inverse effect. If it was uh, 1.08 and then the 60 over, let's say it was S, now you're taking your seconds, or you're taking your rate and you're dividing it by the second. So you're making it more minute. Whereas putting it on the outside, right, you're doing the opposite. You have to understand the difference between going from something like daily to weekly or weekly to daily or seconds to minutes or minutes to seconds, like which direction you're going. I just put that it indicates the increase per unit. Like I didn't put like... Right, which was what Dane's question is. I actually think this is a multiple choice, so it should be a little bit clearer on what you're looking for. So this is the yeah. You just have to know like if it's getting bigger or smaller. Right, like are you in, what are you doing with your rate? Are you taking a rate that's daily and are you multiplying by 365 to figure out how many, day, what it would be in a year? Or are you taking something that's yearly and dividing it by 365 to figure out what would happen for the days? And that's it, that's all you need. Yeah, just know which that's direction you're sense. going. Yeah. Okay. Because I wrote like increase by a factor of 1.09 every minute. 1.09 every minute. Well, I'll just be careful because it would be to the 60th every minute. Yeah, that's your rate. Right, it's this every second, so it would be that for minutes. What? That's your original rate, though. That's your every second. So if you're going per minute, does that make sense? This okay. Yeah, Xander. All right, page three. So this is the other one that you would want to make sure you know uh, how to do for your calculator part, okay? This, it said linear, but you're going to make sure that you would be able to determine which one it is if it gave you linear, because it's going to linear, ex, um, exponential, or quadratic, and that's your R squared values. So look for the R squared that's closest to one, then that would give you which one you want, and then you go from there. Like this one said, find what the actual... Uh, value at 200, what was the predicted value at 200? Compare it to the actual, which is in the chart. And in this case, the predicted value was, was less than the chart value, which means that it was underestimated. If you're a visual person, you're going to have this on your calculator. Feel free to look at your model, right? 
In this case, the model would have been over, no, the model would have been under the, the points. So you would have known it was underestimated. Like, feel free to use the visual of your actual graph to help you with that. Yeah. Okay, two is not appropriate because there's a pattern. Three is appropriate because there is no pattern. So this, I'm gonna, I have to redo this because I changed it after I posted, I mean, after I. The, the, the page after or the questions after? Four, now you're talking about specific data. So they said a doctor's office has collected data regarding patient's age and their cholesterol level. Um, and it wanted you to, to talk about the diff, like what specific does this mean? If P is above the X axis, then it means the model underestimated the cholesterol at that point and specifically to somebody at the age of 43. And then B, the point is below the model. So the model overestimated specifically for somebody that was 58 years old, it overestimated it by 5.02. Number five, again, started with P. This time P is under, so the model overestimated it for uh, the teen birth rate at 14. It overestimated it by 2.08, and this time it said percent, so make sure you pay attention to your units and all that stuff. B point Q, or yeah, point label Q was above it, so the model underestimated which means at the birth rate of 37, the model underestimated by 1.87%. So if it's Correct. Wherever the line is. So if the line is over, then the line overestimated. If the line is under, then the, then the line underestimated. This was a depressing statistic. I always like when I read their statistics, I'm like, is that actually true? This is so far from your norm, but that happens in the world. It's kind of crazy. Birth rates of 14. Mm -hmm. Wait, 14. 14. That's one of the models was 14. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the only way it can be written? Or like, can you like move the stuff around? Like, can you like reword it differently, but like keep the same information? Meaning you could say that the actual data underestimated? No, no, no. Like, or, like for A, you can say like the model overestimated property by 2.8%. When, when the team, no, that's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, just don't flip it and talk about the, the point being overestimated or underestimated. It's the model that you're comparing it to. Yeah, yeah. Lucas. Uh, we have to use the words over, overestimate or underestimate. Yep. Yeah. You have to be specific to the data for a question like this. You can't just write overestimate? Nope. It says in this context, it means give me what you're talking about. So if it just said is it overestimated or underestimated, that's one kind of question. But if it says the words in this context, it means you have to elaborate on it. Specific to the data and the terms that are given for this question. Yeah. Like I use the words uh, higher than the model predicts. Mm. Than it's, it's Over and under. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions on those? All right, then came 2, 7, and 2, 8. I kind of put them together, the composition and the inverse functions. So you need to obviously know how to find the composition functions, how to find the domain of the composite functions. You need to know how to find an inverse with the equations like one, two, three, four, and then also with graphs and a data, I mean, a, a chart of data like the ones underneath, like four, five, six. Xander, you were saying something? Okay. Everybody's good on this stuff? Hadley? Okay. Correct. So we, we have to find the one we plug in. So the, the G of X, right? That G of X, I would go to G of X and I would see if there is a domain restriction. And there wasn't. If there was, I would carry it down. Then I check the answer, which was here. That has to be greater than or equal to zero, which gives you this. If you do the reverse and you're doing F of X into G of X then you would check original domain. And again, it's X is greater than or equal to negative three, which is already here. Then I would check my, compo com my composite function and see if there's an additional one. And there wasn't. I mean, it was the same one, so I just carry it down. But if there was two, 
I want to pick the most narrow. So like I, if you need to draw it and pick only where it overlaps, that's what you're looking for. It has to work for both. All right, and then we ended off with the logs. So this is the third question that is calculator base, and that is your logs when you're having to change your base. Okay. And then the rest of this would be done without a calculator. Questions? Yeah. Can you go back to the two Yeah. So you, I would rewrite this as a base of four. So 16 is four to the negative two, but that is being raised to the third power. When you have a power to a power, you multiply them, and I would get 4 to the negative 6, and then log base 4 of 4 to the negative 6, I literally just grab the, negative the exponent because the base on the log and the base on the exponential part are the same. You're welcome. This would now be not calculator. Correct. The only log that's calculator is like 8 and 9. 